Hi, welcome. I'm your host, Nada Youssef. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have the director of the Cerebrovascular Center, Dr. Shazam Hussain, and today we're taking your questions regarding stroke. So any questions you guys may have, leave it, leave it please in the uh, comment section below. And before we get started, please remember this is for informational purposes only and not intended to replace your own physician's advice. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, before we begin, is there anything you want to introduce yourself to our viewers that maybe I didn't touch on? Uh, no, the, uh, I'm one of the stroke neurologists here at the Cleveland Clinic, and I also do stroke intervention. Uh, stroke is a very interesting area now, a lot of very interesting developments, which mm -hmm. I'm hoping we can touch on over the next uh, half an hour. Sure thing. All right, well, strokes affect nearly 800,000 Americans every year, and women at a higher risk than men, and we'll get to that in a point. But first, I want to talk about what is a stroke exactly and what different types of stroke are there. Mm -hmm. So a uh, stroke is a sudden onset of neurological dysfunction attributed to either the brain or the eye uh, or the spinal cord. And uh, basically, the actual word stroke actually is a Greek word that comes to strike because it really mm -hmm. does strike people out of nowhere and causes them... Uh, to have this, these disabilities. Uh, overall, from strokes, we actually have two major categories. We talk about the ischemic type strokes and the hemorrhagic type strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, ischemic type strokes are a type of stroke where a blood clot comes from somewhere in the body and blocks off a blood vessel to the brain that deprives it of that blood that it really, really needs um, and therefore causes its problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas a hemorrhagic type stroke is when there's actually a bursting of the blood vessel causing bleeding in the brain. Okay, so um, so the blood clot could be anywhere in your body and that could cause that stroke. Yeah, correct? usually on the arterial side, the most common locations either come from the carotid arteries mm -hmm. or they can originate in the heart and then come up to the brain. I so. see, I see. Okay, and why are women uh, are at a higher risk? Why is that? Yeah, women can be at a higher risk. It's usually related to hormonal factors mm -hmm. that, that occur in women. So as, especially as, as uh, women age and there's changes in the estrogen levels as time goes on, that seems to increase the risk. Actually, estrogen is protective, so at a younger age, they seem to be a little bit better protected from stroke. Yeah. But as, as, as unfortunately, as, as women get older and kind of lose that protection, that, that puts them at a higher risk. We also know, um, you know that women generally don't recover necessarily as well as men, and this mm -hmm. is thought to be more more actually a social issue that oftentimes women are actually taking care of the men who have the stroke, mm. whereas because they're at later in life, maybe their husbands have passed away or, or f family members uh, have passed away, women when they have their strokes doesn't necessarily have the same kind of support that the men do, um, and sometimes we'll have a little tougher time recovering because of that. Oh, interesting. And um, major risk factors and causes, is it different, first of all, for women than men, or is this kind of uh, equal? In, in general, the, the risk factors are generally pretty similar between mm -hmm. men and women. Uh, overall, you know, we talk about the, the risk factors that we can control and the mm -hmm. ones we can't control. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest risk factor for stroke is age, which none of us have a solution to yet, sure. um, but hopefully someday. Mm -hmm. um, uh, otherwise, though, that there are many risk factors that we can control when it comes to stroke. Uh, particularly, the biggest one is actually high blood pressure. So mm -hmm. if we were able to control everybody's blood pressure in the United States and keep it normal, we'd actually eliminate half the strokes that occur in the country. So wow. really, really, if you had to pick one, really blood pressure is the big blood one. Blood pressure is control. the biggest one. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we talk about other risk factors like having high cholesterol, uh, if you have diabetes, that puts you at higher risk. Mm -hmm. uh, if you smoke, really, I don't know why anybody smokes nowadays, but right. if you do smoke, you've got to quit because that really puts you at high risk of not only stroke but many other diseases. Sure. Uh, leading a sedentary lifestyle. Um, all of these factors are really also incorporated and can cause increased risk of having a stroke. So. Sure, sure. Now, um, I know we have our right and left brain hemispheres, and mm -hmm. the strokes usually happen on one side versus another. Mm -hmm. um, does that change things? Because I know like on the right side is more creative, on the left is more language, and there's all this stuff mm -hmm. uh, to go into the factors. How does that affect a stroke and mm -hmm. a patient that has a right versus left stroke? Right, yeah, absolutely. The, the, when a stroke, uh, someone has a stroke, the type of symptoms they have is dependent upon where in the brain that actual stroke is occurring. And mm -hmm. so we talk about, yeah, the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, also the back of the brain has a little bit of different symptoms mm -hmm. uh, compared to those two areas. So starting with the left side of the brain, this side of the brain usually is what controls uh, str strength and power function of the body is crossed. So left side of the brain is what's going to control the right side of the body. Okay. Uh, so you can have drooping in the face, weakness of the arm or leg on that and side. On the right side. On the right okay. side if it's the left side of the brain. And mm -hmm. then language function, as you said, is also controlled on that left side. So d ability to both express and receive language can be affected mm -hmm. in the midst of having a stroke on the left side of the brain. Versus the right side, which we would expect then the left side of the body would have the weakness. Sure. Uh, but also we can have other, other things we come to attention to the world. Uh, we have a syndrome of neglect, for example, where someone would have a tendency to ignore one half of the world. 
Oftentimes with strokes on the right side of the brain, in fact, uh, people actually not even recognize they're having a stroke uh, because oh, wow. they just tend to ignore s s everything that's going on yeah. with that side of the body. So, uh, And then the back part of the brain, this can be a really uh, dangerous area to have a stroke, but uh, this can sometimes even control our consciousness, so people can present with a coma. Mm. Uh, people can also present with double vision or balance difficulties or other types of visual problems. So. Right. Now, if I'm witnessing someone having a stroke, um, do I drive them to the uh, to, to the hospital? Do I call 911? What is the first what, What's the first step to do? Mm -hmm, yeah, so uh, recognizing the stroke is really really important because actually it's estimated only 36 percent of Americans even know one symptom of a stroke. So mm. glad we're having the opportunity to sure. review these symptoms. Uh, we use an acronym called Be Fast to help people remember the symptoms. So if you go through the Be Fast, uh, B stands B for balance. E standing for eyes, so if there's any kind of trouble with the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, F standing for face, if there's droopiness on one side of the face or the other. A for arm, so arm strength, and you can extend that to the leg as well if there's any weakness of the arm or leg. Mm -hmm. S standing for speech, if you're having any kind of speaking difficulties. And then that T is in there as a time, it means time to call 911. Okay. Um, and so, you know, in answer to the question about who, what to do in that situation, it's really, really important actually to allow the medical professionals to handle that situation. Best thing to do is as soon as you see, you know, if you yourself are experiencing these symptoms or if you see someone with these symptoms, best to call 911. You let the EMS professionals uh, get out there, mm -hmm. uh, assess the situation because it's really, really, there's a lot of factors uh, that can influence what we can do with the person. And one of the biggest ones is actually time, how mm -hmm. quickly they can get to the hospital and come to medical attention. Wow. And and then uh, in Cleveland Clinic here, we do have a mobile stroke unit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is, so this is an innovative new approach to things. So as, as a standard rule you know, around the country, again, calling 911, the paramedics, uh, e e EMS professionals, will pick up a, a person and then get them to usually the closest hospital or the hospital that can best take care of uh, that stroke situation. Sure. We've uh, been, been developed a, a technology here, uh, or innovative approach, where we've actually taken a CT scanner and have the ability to put that into an ambulance. Oh, wow. Um, and so the reason that that's important is that, unfortunately, there's no way to tell the different types of strokes we were talking about before, right. the ischemic type of stroke and the hemorrhagic type of stroke. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell the difference between those unless you have the CAT scan. And so that's really limited us before. That person really had to be in the hospital, unlike other diseases where sometimes we can start treatment in the field. We right. need that CT scan before we can do anything. So CT scanners now have come into such a technology that they've actually become small enough where you can fit them inside an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And we also now have the ability virtually to be able to beam into the vehicle using telemedicine. Oh, wow. um, so it allows us basically, to uh, when a 911 call is placed, this ambulance can go to the scene of where the person's having their stroke, whether mm -hmm. it be at their home or at their work or at another location. We can get them into our ambulance, take a CAT scan, and uh, the doctor can then beam in via telemedicine, assess the situation, and we can actually start treatments right there in the field. Wow. And we're saving on average about 40 minutes of time. Uh, wow. And just to put that in, in perspective, every minute in a situation of stroke, you're losing about 2 million brain cells a minute. Wow. Um, and so really it's a situation where every minute counts, so that 40 minutes can really, really uh, add up to a lot of sure. impact for that patient. Sure. So. That's excellent. Um, and then now I, I always go to diet. Um, does your diet affect the risks of a stroke? What, is there something we should stay away from? Is it kind of food we should be eating? What kind of diet do you recommend? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so, you know, coming back to you, this comes back to the risk factors, and absolutely stroke is a preventable problem. So I think that's really, really important to emphasize. We usually advocate for, for a good diet that will, you know, be so-called so a, a, a good diet for blood vessels. And mm -hmm. so it's very similar to what people will recommend for the heart. You want to make sure watching the amount of salt that you're taking in the diet. Okay. Because, uh, of course, high salt can lead to high blood pressure, which, as right. we mentioned, is can one of the biggest risk factors for stroke. Uh, watching the amount of saturated fats and trans fats in the diet. If you like fish, fish a couple times a week is usually good for people because mm -hmm. uh, of the type of oils that are in there. It, right. it, it promotes uh, good cholesterol uh, in the body. Uh, if you have diabetes, of course, and just in general, probably watching the amount of carbohydrates and sugars that your, your body is uh, you know, taking in would be important as well. Sure. And in addition to diet, again, I always like to emphasize again the exercise portion of things that really it's really important. We usually recommend either 30 minutes to an hour a day of some kind of good physical activity. Because okay. that really also it really helps to keep those blood vessels nice and healthy. Sure, sure. Now, is there an age that your, um, your risk for stroke you know, goes significantly increased at a certain age? Or is this, can this happen to young 
younger people? Yeah, generally speaking, it's, it's always been thought to be a condition of you know, more o older individuals. And mm -hmm. so in general, your risk starts to really start to go up after the age of you know, 60, 65. Okay. However, uh, unfortunately, as many of, I mean, many of us know, uh, in the United States, especially because of our bad diets and lack of exercise and other risk factors, that we're seeing that age getting younger and younger and younger. And uh, unfortunately, also, there's uh, other types of strokes that can even present, uh, other reasons to have a stroke that can present at a very, very young age. So we really do see it throughout the spectrum sure, uh, sure. of all the age ranges, uh, which is why, again, very, very important to be vigilant about these symptoms, even if someone's at a younger age, right. in their 30s or 40s, for example, and has these symptoms, it's important not to just brush it off and think that they couldn't have a stroke, because right. that very well could be, and it's really, really important to get these people to the hospital sure. right away. Sure, very good information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to jump on to some uh, live questions. Um, I have Patricia. Can epidurals that were difficult to place cause seizures and strokes? Uh, yeah, so I think we're talking about epidural um, catheters. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, um, we usually don't attribute an epidural catheter. I guess it would depend a little bit on the specifics of the situation, but okay. uh, in general, uh, if it's it, with the epidural, if there was a bit of bleeding or something that might have occurred, then it, it's possible that could track around and maybe, but it's a very, very unusual reason to have a stroke. So. Okay. And then uh, I have Sydney. Um, does fish help? Um, does fish oil help stop strokes? Uh, so, you know, a as we mentioned, uh, eating fish a couple times a week, and that's thought to be related to the oil in the fish that does seem to help promote good cholesterol. Right. And so it could, from a dietary perspective, could be effective. When they look specifically at the fish oil capsules, uh, there's never been a study that actually shows that that has a significant impact on prevention of strokes. But uh, I think in general, if this is something that your physician recommends, obviously you talk to your physician and, and discuss this with them, uh, it can be an effective part of the treatment uh, in certain cases. And speaking of healthy oils, um, Rodrigo, uh, what is your opinion about ketogenic diet in relation to stroke? Uh, you know, a ketogenic diet uh, certainly has its place in certain uh, aspects. We typically see it use it more so in the situation of seizures, and particularly in bad, to, very, very hard to control seizures. Mm -hmm. In the situation of stroke, it's never been really proven to be effective in you know, you know promoting, promoting good health, and there can be a lot of challenges to the body when you're using a ketogenic diet. So again, this is something you really want to talk to your physician, mm -hmm. uh, have a good discussion with them about the pros and cons of being on a ketogenic diet before you uh, employ or use that as a, sure. as a strategy. So. Sure. And it looks like we're getting, I mean, a lot of questions regarding seizures and, and strokes. Can you tell me the relation? Does every stroke patient, like, do they have a seizure at the end of their stroke, and, and why is that? No, no, not necessarily, but certainly uh, stroke uh, can be a risk for having seizures. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what happens with stroke uh, is that it can create a scar, a little bit of a scar on the brain from the injury mm -hmm. that happens to the brain, and that scar then can be a site, site from which a seizure, which essentially is an electrical storm in the brain, uh, extra mm -hmm. electrical activity, that's, that, that scar can be the factor that predisposes or launches the, the seizure. Mm -hmm. It's not very seen very commonly, though. It's only about 10% of strokes that have the, seizures associated with oh, them. Okay. So. Okay. Um, and then Sarah, if you have an is it embolic stroke, mm -hmm. uh, do you have less of a chance to have another if your heart rhythm is back to normal? Mm -hmm, yeah, emb embolic strokes are you know, one of the major causes of stroke, and uh, certainly many of those can come from the heart, which is why when we're doing an evaluation for stroke, it's really important to do a good evaluation of the heart. We mm -hmm. usually like to do a good ultrasound of the heart, uh, also to get a monitor of the heart rhythm, uh, as, as she mentions here. Um, so, you know, there's there certain heart rhythm problems, particularly atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. uh, that does increase your risk of having strokes, and so there's definitely th and treatment strategies that you want to discuss, uh, you and your doctor will want to discuss to make sure you're keeping yourself at uh, as low as risk possible. Mm -hmm. um, in general, if, if the heart rhythm is back to normal, um, and we have to be cautious that we, when they're calling it normal, it can't be also flipping in and out of normal, because that can right. also be risky, but right. if it's truly back to normal, then overall that risk should be fairly low of having repeat stroke, so. Okay, and then when we say stroke and let's say a uh, heart attack, because mm -hmm. I know with, like, with heart attacks you are to chew on an aspirin. That's what we know from Heart Month in February. We talked a lot about that. Okay. Um, what about stroke? Do, do we chew on an aspirin? Is there a relation between the two at all? Yeah, for, for stroke, we actually don't recommend uh, chewing an aspirin. Okay. Uh, if, if, if you do, it, I don't think it's detrimental. It's not going to hurt anything. But certainly, there's no evidence that it actually helps in that situation. Mm -hmm. Again, the really critical thing there is call 911, let the EMS professionals uh, come and pick you up, 
get you to a hospital that can take care of strokes, and yeah. that, that offers you your best chance, because there are really good therapies for, for stroke that are available now. Uh, in particular, we use uh, a clot buster medicine through the intravenous called TPA, mm -hmm. Tissue Plasminogen Activator, or TPA. Uh, this is a clot busting medication that we can give within four and a half hours of the start of stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, really effective medication. And then also for the speci special type of stroke called elbow type stroke, or emergent large vessel occlusion. This is where a large blood clot actually goes from uh, some location mm -hmm. and, and blocks off a major artery of the brain. Sometimes we'll actually have to do a catheter-based technique called thrombectomy, where we thread a catheter through the arteries to get up to where the clot is and remove it out of the blood vessel. Oh, wow. um, and that can be actually administered even up to 24 hours in certain patients. So, sure, sure. Uh, But all of these are very, very time dependent. That's why you want to get to a hospital right away to make, give yourself the best chance to being able to receive those treatments if you're eligible. Okay, great. And then I have to ask, um, just because you said the back part of your brain can have you kind of like unconscious, correct? Mm -hmm, sure. So if I see someone unconscious in front of me, I'm thinking chest compressions. Does that hurt any, or is that is that okay? No, no so it certainly wouldn't hurt in a situation of stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, again, if you've gone through your you know your B B C B C L S, your life support training training, and sure. uh, you're checking for a pulse, you're not feeling a pulse. Obviously, important to get that you know CPR administered right away. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't it wouldn't uh, cause any wouldn't, problems or issues way. with uh, if anything, it's helpful. So. Sure, great. Uh, Misty asks, uh, why can evidence of stroke on CTB uh, occurred for up to 24 hours. What about the patient who cannot have an MRI? Mm -hmm. a, a CT scan is a, is a, is a, it's a good test for stroke. Uh, it sh often shows uh, changes uh, that, that, uh, that show up, but unfortunately it is a test that it sometimes takes a bit of time. Okay. Usually we estimate usually it takes about 6 to 12 hours for the ch changes to first start showing up on a oh, CT wow. scan. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why sometimes it, it is uh, helpful to have an MRI scan, which is just a much more detailed picture of the brain. Sure, sure. Uh, it can it identify stroke much, much earlier than a, a CT scan will. Um, now, you know, usually in that situation if a person can't get an MRI scan, then there are other strategies where we can repeat CT scans down the line mm -hmm. um, to see evidence of the stroke or not. And, and it's important to remember also when we're talking about using these acute therapies, the intravenous TPA or the clot removal mm -hmm. um, or, uh, or else identifying blood, really the CT scan, the importance of that CT scan isn't so much to really absolutely see the stroke, it's really to make sure that there's no blood in the brain. Right. Because um, the treatment, if you're imagining giving an intravenous clot buster, if you had bleeding in your brain, that could be very dangerous. Sure. And so that's why we really need that CAT scan early on. So um, I as long as that CAT scan doesn't show any blood, that opens up the options for different kinds of treatment. Great. And then uh, Shauna wants to know, is wishing in your ears always a sign for issues coming later? Uh, yeah, wishing in the ears is, uh, you know, can come from a variety of different causes. Um, you know, uh, the most common reason we see it for is and there's some little bit of uh, turbulence in the blood flow. So normally blood kind of flows in the blood vessels like a quiet stream. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it can be like water in rapids and swirling oh. around. And that's thought to be related to, you know, sometimes when you hear this whooshing sensation. And also there can be other, other causes for it, uh, but those are kind of the more vascular causes. I see. Um, so, you know, it, it's not necessarily, though, a sign of issues that are going to be coming per se. It just means that there may be a little bit of turbulence to the blood flow. And, uh, you know, it's important to probably talk that over with your physician, but I don't want anybody panicking and starting to run to emergency. Sure because I hear this, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a sign of a uh, big issue coming up. So Okay, great. And then uh, Pam, my husband has um, right, is it car carotid? Corroded? 100% mm -hmm. blocked. Uh, we were told nothing can be done. Is there anything he can do to prevent that stroke? Well, the, the, the most important thing actually when you have 100% blockage, it's, it's interesting that when your artery is 100% blocked, you're actually in a safer situation than when it's 90% blocked. Mm. Um, and you can kind of imagine this like having a dam on a river. Um, if you had a dam on a river and it blocked up the water all the way, even if there was garbage in that river, it's not going anywhere. It's just right. staying right there. Right. Whereas if there's a little bit of a channel and you have a little bit of water going through, then all of a sudden that garbage can flow downstream and your town below can get garbage in it. So similarly, when you talk about stroke, if that artery is actually blocked up 100%, there's no way anything's getting through there to get you know, right, uh, right. debris or anything up to cause a stroke. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you're completely out of woods, though, because it is indicative that there is problems with your blood vessels. And again, we come back to the issue that you've got to take care of your blood vessels. Sure. So that means working with your doctors to make sure you're on the right medications, uh, particularly you know, the cholesterol medications can be very effective because they sure. help, help promote and heal up the blood vessels, um, in addition to you know, good diet and exercise and taking care of making sure you know, if you lose one of your carotid arteries, normally we have four arteries to the brain, two carotid arteries in the front, two vertebral arteries in the back. Mm -hmm. If you're down a carotid artery, you only have three going to the brain, and you really can't afford to lose another one. So right, right, very right. important to make sure you keep your blood vessels nice and healthy. So. Okay. Uh, Cindy, um, are red rice yeast capsules beneficial? 
Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's no strong evidence per se. Uh, we don't have a study, for example, that shows us that red yeast, uh, red yeast capsules are. Mm -hmm. But you know, as with any of these things, I think you know, you know, anecdotally, people will sometimes feel that they're effective. And as long as it's not interfering, kind of, with your usual treatment plan, uh, you know, discuss it with your physicians. As long as there's no concern about it, I don't think there's any detriment to taking it. So. Okay, great. Um, Sue, my husband has a post valve AFib and has about 40 to 60 episodes per month. He has had two ablations and gets dizzy and spinning occasionally. Uh, he still drives, but as you can tell, he cannot run into the ER every time one of those episodes happen. He's on warfarin. Is there anything else that we can do? I think for you know th that uh, you know this kind of situation, it's really important to ch consult with your physician. Uh, certainly, you know we, we have great uh, you know uh, for example in our our center we would ha you know ask our cardiology team yes. to assess this patient because uh, there certainly are very useful uh, treatments that can be available to a person in that situation. I think from a stroke perspective, we have someone in atrial fibrillation. Really, the the most important treatment is to be on strong blood thinners like warfarin, and there's also newer ones that are out there. Um, and from our standpoint, the being in the atrial fibrillation itself isn't a necessarily an issue, mm -hmm. um, but it's, the, it's really the, the being on the blood thinners to prevent clots from forming and going and causing strokes. So sure, sure. As long, even if you're in atrial fibrillation, as long as you're on those blood thinners, you should be in you good shape. You should be okay. So. Great. Um, Gabby asks, what happens when a stroke patient is admitted to the hospital? Um, basically, why is it so important to find the source of the stroke or mm -hmm. how? Yeah, Actually, it's, uh, it's, uh, so getting, getting to the bottom of why the stroke happens, I think, is really, really important uh, because we really tailor our treatments based on what kind of uh, you know, process we find. So the, and really, the most important things we sort out while you're in the hospital is to get a good look at your blood vessels, mm -hmm. make sure there's no blockages or narrowings that we may have to worry about in terms of, of treating. And then the second place is to focus in on the heart, as we mentioned, looking at a ultra, good ultrasound of the heart, mm -hmm. as well as getting a monitoring of the heart rhythm. Um, as well as then, again, in specific situations, there are a series of other tests that could be employed to get to the bottom of why the stroke happened. Um, and so depending on what the source is, then you know, there's different treatments. For example, if you have a blockage in your carotid artery, this may require some kind of either surgery or stent to fix it. Right. And also going again back to the medications, there are certain medications we want to use in that situation to help treat the stroke. Uh, for if it's coming from the heart, if we find atrial fibrillation again, for example, we're going to be going on stronger blood thinners. So uh, really trying to get to the bottom of why the stroke happened really helps us to tailor the treatment towards what's going on and, sure. and prevent, protect that person hopefully best from having a stroke in the future. Sure, because treatments are all different based on what you're having. Yeah, right? a stroke is a very, very broad term yeah. that encompasses many, many, many uh, conditions. So un unlike kind of when we talk about the heart, for example, we know that mo almost 90, 95 percent of that is related to blockage of the blood vessel. Right. In stroke, there's a huge variety of different causes. And so finding out the exact type of stroke and, and what that underlying causes really helps us to tailor that treatment to that okay, individual. Sure. Um, Elaine, if family members have AFib, how likely will it be for another female mother to also have it? I guess is it hereditary? Yeah, it's, uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, can have uh, you know ties to family. So certainly, if a family member has atrial fibrillation, other family members should be on the watch for it. Okay. Uh, the number one risk for atrial fibrillation is actually age. So okay. uh, everyone, as they get older, also has this risk of atrial fibrillation. But sure. uh, if somebody in the family has it, you know, uh, you know, there there are the other family members are at higher risk, and probably it's good worth making sure your physicians know about that so they can properly watch out for that. And lower your risks. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Michael, what is the difference between a hemorrhagic hemorrhagic stroke and an aneurysm? Mm -hmm. Good question. So uh, hemorrhagic stroke, again, is a bit of a broad term. And so within hemorrhagic stroke, we have something called subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. And the main reason we see that is from a brain aneurysm, which is essentially is a weak spot on the blood vessel that can then leak or break mm -hmm. that causes bleeding around the brain. And so uh, we also run into the situation where we have uh, brain aneurysms that haven't leaked. And so uh, important that we do an evaluation in those cases to understand what the person's risk for that potentially breaking is. Uh, it's actually an interesting statistic that if you look on, you know, did scans on everybody walking on the street, about 1 in 20 people actually have a brain aneurysm. Wow. Most of them, though, are very, very tiny, never going to cause a person a problem. They'll never know they have it, never have an issue. But they break at a rate of about 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000. And mm -hmm. if they do break, that can be a dangerous situation. Sure. So if one is found, again, not, not something that you necessarily need to panic over, but important to get it checked out by a sure. specialist that really understands brain aneurysms, sure. uh, usually which would be either an uh, interventional, um, uh, interventionalist of some kind, and right. which can be a neurologist, neurosurgeon or radiologist or uh, otherwise neurosurgeons that deal with brain aneurysms. Sure. So. Now speaking of symptoms, are there, uh, is there any way that you don't know that you just had a stroke? Like if you have like a mini stroke? Because I've, I've read a little bit about how people maybe don't know that they just had a stroke. Yeah, yeah. So certainly um, the term mini stroke really, people t tend to use that more if someone has had 
s symptoms of a stroke that were temporary. Okay. So you have some kind of you know difficulty speaking, maybe a little bit of weakness in your arm, but it goes away after you know 10, 15 minutes. So mm. people call that a mini stroke. Um, there also are those silent strokes, as you mentioned, where right. someone may not know, and that's re reflective of that. There are sometimes strokes, depending on where it hits you in the brain. If it hits a very strategic part of the brain, mm. you're going to end up with a lot of symptoms. But if it ends up hitting a part of the brain that maybe you know has a little, you, it doesn't necessarily put, produce direct symptoms, you can take a stroke in that area and really not uh, experience much in terms of symptoms. Mm -hmm. However, it's important still to be able to kind of do those assessments for patients because we know that if silent strokes really do start to accumulate, that that can also start to affect things like memory and thinking. Right. And coming into the broader topic of how stroke can affect other things, we know that there's a whole subset of dementia called vascular dementia, mm -hmm. uh, which is it's a huge proportion of the number of people who have dementias. And it's really related to these silent strokes that are occurring sure, in the brain. So. Sure. Uh, let's see, and then we have Jan. Uh, once you had a factor, once you have, once you had a factor five done, and it is negative, will it ever change? And what mm. is a factor five? I guess that's uh, the next question. For mm, you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, fa factor five is a, is a type of factor that's in the blood that looks at clotting, basically. And okay. Uh, in general, from a stroke perspective, uh, it really it more so comes to. Um, the vein side of the circulation. So we worry more with factor five about people developing blood clots in their legs or in their lungs mm -hmm. as opposed to stroke, although it can occasionally be related to strokes as well. Um, it is uh, thought to be related to genetics so that if, if your factor five is negative, it should be negative for life. So. Okay, great. Um, Vanessa is asking what is the most common treatment of stroke? Uh, so, you know, uh, we kind of mentioned, talked about the acute treatments for stroke, which is sure. one type. I think she's probably more so getting at kind of more, you know, how do you prevent strokes or longer term right. things. So, again, most common reason for stroke is related to blockages of arteries. And mm -hmm. so we tend to focus mostly in on those risk factors. So making sure someone's on a bit of a blood thinner, which usually involves aspirin or, or okay. medication like aspirin to thin out the blood a little bit, which prevents against both stroke and heart attack and other okay. vascular problems. We also want to then focus on high blood pressure, making sure a person's blood pressure gets under control. And in general, we want people, from a stroke perspective, we like people under the target of 140 over 90. That's really okay. the, the highest we'd ever want to see someone's sure. blood pressure. Sure. And then uh, you know, working with their cholesterol, uh, working with if they have diabetes, getting their sugars right. under control. If they're smoking, getting them to stop so quit smoking. So okay. uh, that's usually vascular health is the biggest thing. All right. And then, Cynthia, I had a mini stroke four years ago. No physical problems, thank goodness, but I'm not the same mentally. How can I improve? It's very frustrating. Mm. And I'll piggyback on this and kind of maybe talk a little bit about recovery once you answer that question mm, as true. well. Yeah, yeah no, and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, um, a after a stroke or a mini stroke, uh, it's, it's actually very common for people to describe that they don't feel their thinking is quite the same as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they'll feel their energy level is not the same and they feel a lot more fatigued and don't have the wind in their sails, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately this is something that generally does get better over time in, in the majority of people. Uh, unfortunately, there's no magic pill or, or right. something for that. You just, it's a matter of trying to get back into your routine, uh, keeping active in terms of you know, mental, uh, mental activities especially. Um, the worst thing you can see people do is when they feel tired or run down that they end up just kind of lying Giving on the couch. And, yeah. and Because that actually then starts a vicious cycle where you just get more deconditioned and, and sure. you feel worse and worse and worse. Sure. So for, yeah, from a mental perspective, again, trying to do what you can uh, to kind of make sure you're really working very hard. Uh, and sometimes this is where the therapist can also be help helpful with cognitive therapy, which Sure. Either you're done by occupational therapists or speech therapists. Uh, they can often give exercises to help kind of you know continue to exercise uh, the mind, so to speak, when it comes to mental sure. tasks. Sure. Uh, recovery is a, a huge area in stroke. So and, and, and again, there's there's often a lot of pessimism when it comes to stroke that people say, well, people person's had a stroke and it's a very devastating event and they'll never recover from it. The, the truth is, of course, is the stroke is very treatable and mm -hmm. preventable and treatable as we've discussed. And also from the recovery side, a lot of great work is being done. Sure. Uh, we usually talk about stroke recovery mainly in the first three months after a stroke, but even to a year or more, we see people that have improvements. Yeah. And there's a lot of work you know, with the therapists, you know, all the different types of therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, are really doing great work and great research to develop those areas. Uh, we have all kinds of also new devices now yeah. uh, that are available and uh, different kinds of you know, clinical trials and other things that are going on, really trying to enhance how people can recover from sure. the strokes. So. Sure. And then I have just one more question for you before mm. I let you go. Uh, Beth wants to know, um, do I have permanent brain damage from this? stroke. Is, is, is the damage permanent? I guess it all depends on how it was handled, maybe? Yeah, well, and, and you know, for, you know, if, if we're talking about stroke, and usually when we're talking about stroke, we mean that on the MRI scan there's some evidence of injury or, or injury right. or damage to the brain. Right. So, and unfortunately, yes, the answer is yes, that the damage from a stroke is permanent. Mm -hmm. 
The good news, though, about stroke is that the brain has a lot of capacity to recover. And yes. so the n areas that are normal surrounding the damaged part can actually take over for that area that's permanently wow. injured. And so know. this is where we see a lot of recovery, which again comes back to if someone has had a stroke, working hard with those therapists because they're essentially, it's like an athlete training for an event. You've got to get your brain and body yeah. retrained sure. after, after a stroke occurs. And with that therapy, we really see people make great recoveries to the point that really you won't even know they have had a stroke. So, wow. so there's awesome. definitely there's always this great potential for having a stroke. So really important, if you can get early treatment, that's really, really effective to improving your outcome. And then also getting good therapy, good rehabilitation can and help And noticing your symptoms, right? And yeah, noticing it's number symptoms. one thing. If you notice your symptoms, get to the hospital. That's yeah. going to yeah. give your best chance of getting better. So. Sure thing. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Is there anything else that you wanted um, to add to, to this conversation? Uh, no, that's great. Thank you for having me. I sure. uh, really uh, mm -hmm. appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about stroke. So. Sure, great. Thank you so much. And if any of you are interested, our next Facebook Live next week will be about anxiety and depression with Dr. Karen Jacobs. So make sure you tune in for that. And for more health tips and information, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Cleveland Clinic One Word. Thank you. We'll see you next time.